let's get started. I only have 30 minutes and uh, that can go as long as we need it to. Or, well, it's a wide subject, really. Okay, so a uh, few words about me first. Uh, I'm a MySQL developer, currently uh, leading a team uh, working on the MySQL server code. Um, I've been a long time guest to this conference. I really like it and I uh, like the community in, in OpenSUSE. So I think it's important that uh, MySQL is present here and uh, well, we uh, show what we are working on to, to you guys. Right, so uh, first of all, I would like to say that please don't make any purchasing decisions based on the uh, presentation here. It's just for your information. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, how you can go about adding functionality to MySQL. Uh, in the nutshell, it's a very easy answer. Basically, it's an open source project. You just hack on it and then, well, you get results. But um, because uh, writing database kernels is not an easy matter, we have come up with a ways to, uh, well, make it a bit more simpler than that. So those are the first three items on my agenda here. It's the, the basic way, the old way, and the new way that we have in MySQL 8.0. And of course, uh, the last one is the traditional way to add functionality that you may think of. Right, so we'll start with the basic way. Typically, when you want to extend a MySQL, uh, a database server, really, what you really want to add is another function that you can call from, uh, from the SQL language. And this is what user-defined functions are, actually. They, are, uh, they operate on this basic level. They assume that you pass a certain set of arguments to the function, and then you get a single result, really. That's what it is. It, this interface has been around with MySQL for probably 15 years now. So there's a good number of uh, usage examples of this interface. And because it's that old, it's also very basic. So, um, well, it works for the basic stuff again, but not for the um, more advanced things that you may want to do. That's the architecture of the UDFs. Uh, the client executes some sort of an SQL that triggers internally in the server, triggers a UDF call, which is, stands for user-defined function. And then that calls this external component, component that is loaded inside the server, and that produces some result, which is then sent back to the client. That's in a nutshell what it is. So pros and cons of that, as I can say, as I said already, it's very easy, very ancient, very well documented because of that, and uh, kind of easily understood by people. Uh, it's also dynamically loadable, so if you have like a running server, you can, uh, well, install your extra shared object and then, well, have it be executed by the server process. Cons are, uh, it can return a single value. That's the biggest uh, limitation of it, really. And there's a couple of extra things, like it cannot generate proper SQL errors. It can just return that value. And um, also, it has kind of a limited data type support. It does not support all the modern types of the database engine. Yeah, and another kind of maintenance hurdle is that uh, you need to be defining, if you have like a single shared object with say 10 functions, you need to execute create function 10 times for each of these functions. It's kind of inconvenient. Uh, and here is an example of how one, one of those functions really looks like. So uh, this particular one takes a variable number of arguments and then does certain things based on the type of the argument, really. 
okay, so you can check for nows there, you can uh, return the, the set result, and uh, yeah, it's pretty basic, really. And this is how it uh, looks like when you want to compile it. This is based on the source distribution, actually. So uh, if you have a binary distribution, what we call a binary distribution of MySQL, you may uh, skip some of the include parts here, but well, that's the source. I'm a developer, so I work on the source. Uh, and that's how you compile this single function. And then this is how you install it as well and run it. As you can see, it uh, operates as expected. Basically, it mm, will uh, sum the, the one and the two on the last example, and then add to that the length of the string, which is three, and you get the six. So, yeah, kind of nifty. Uh, if you want to run a service inside the server, uh, i.e. Uh, run an extra thread or uh, have some sort of a background processing going on, uh, the traditional way of doing that inside MySQL is called the plugin API. So that has been around uh, with MySQL since 5.0, I believe. Uh, there is also a book on the subject uh, written by the architect of this uh, interface. I strongly recommend it if you consider doing that. Uh, and the premise here is a bit different. So those of you familiar with, uh, say, the um, Apache modules, uh, it's a similar concept here, or, uh, well, Basically, you have the SQL query, and then the server at certain points decides, okay, I want to check for pluggable functionality. Like, uh, for example, authenticating users is one such uh, checkpoint. All the authentication in MySQL is done via plugins, and it's because the server decides, okay, I now want to go and instead of authenticating this user account, I want to go and uh, search for plugins that do that. But of course, there is this uh, other type of plugin, which we call the daemon plugin. Uh, basically, this only gets initialization and deinitialization when loaded or unloaded from the server. And you are free to do your own background processing, like open a listening socket or whatever. I mean, this is, for example, how uh, our new protocol plugin operates. It's a it's a daemon plugin that listens on 33060 and listens for the new X protocol. Right, but the premise is simple. Uh, the server decides when to talk to the plugin, and then the plugin can only talk to the server. That's it. Okay, pros and cons, I mentioned already some of those. Uh, uh, they, this has been around, and there's a lot of examples. So you have a good starting point and a good boilerplate to, to work on. And also, storage engines are plugins uh, of a sort. Uh, so it's uh, driving important parts of the server, really. So if you want to write plugins, uh, there is not a very rough start. I mean, you have a lot of examples. And they are dynamically loadable. You can uh, basically uh, call uh, server functions if you know them, because uh, when you link the plugins, we'll see later, uh, they, you link them with the server binary symbols. So basically, it's a shared object that can go back into the server main binary, all the public symbols of it. Kind of interesting. So if you lack this particular interface from the server that you need, you may just as well just call the internal functions and be done with it. This, of course, has risks because you cannot really have portable plugins. Basically, uh, if you do that, then you need to compile your plugin with every new server version that that is out there. But it's tempting because there's a lot of functionality that you can access. Okay, so cons are, the biggest cons of plugins is that the plugins can only talk to the server. 
So server is like this focal point of plugins. And if you want, say, your uh, auditing, uh, your uh, storage engine to talk to your auditing plugin, then you basically need a proxy service in the server that allows uh, other plugins to talk to the, um, uh, to the auditing plugin. And that's kind of tedious. I mean, for every new plugin that you add, if you want to enable it for other plugins, you need to do this extra proxy service so that the plugins can call it. Otherwise, it's only the server that can interact with it. That's the, that's the biggest uh, architectural limitation, if you like. Hmm. Okay, so another thing is that uh, you don't have explicit dependencies because of the plugins talking only to the server. So they expect that you, your plugin does not depend on any other pluggable functionality, which is kind of limiting. Or you need to handle the dependencies yourself, basically check, okay, so it, does this work? Then, okay, I'll do whatever, otherwise uh, just bail up. Right, so this is uh, an example authentication plugin, the, probably the simplest one that we have. There is a, even a simpler one, but uh, well, it does not do a lot, it just says yes. So this one does uh, a bit of a, well, maybe it's not really well seen. I see if we can, can zoom a bit like that. Is this better? Okay. So as you can see, this is the main function, um, the main function of the plugin uh, that the server calls when it wants to authenticate, uh, authenticate user. There's a number of arguments passed on top of it, and then uh, what it does is it goes to the Unix socket and checks the uh, Unix user that's authentic. That's so uh, well had that socket opened, and then if the username of that user uh, matches the the username uh, that is passed to the server, then it says OK. So basically, if you are logged in as root, you can be root in MySQL. Or if you are log, logged in as uh, Joe, you only can be Joe in MySQL, nothing else. That's the... But the good part is that you don't need the password because, well, it's already been provided to the system. Um, so the, each plugin also has like a descriptor block of a sort. This is the authentication handler. So as you can see here, it's the authentication function on top. And then some other service functions that we use for various occasions. I can go over this, but we don't really have the time for that. And then it's the plugin declaration. So this plugin declaration basically defines one public symbol that the server searches for when um, it loads the plugin. And from there, it all begins, basically. Uh, Okay, so that's plugins. That's how you write plugins. Plenty of examples, again. Go to sl plugin, slash, and you will find at least 10 of them in the original distro. This is how you compile one. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this is one uh, CMake, simple CMake file that you use to compile a plugin. Uh, basically, you call a CMake macro again, you give it the name of the plugin, the source files, and then you say, I want this plugin to only be compiled as a shared object. That's what module only is. And this have peer cred is some CMake magic to check if you are running on Linux. That's, that's what it is. Okay, and this is how using a plugin looks like. Again, I'll try to zoom a bit. So you install it first, obviously, uh, right here. Uh, and then, uh, well, you create a user uh, using that plugin, so because it's an authentication plugin. And now you can basically just uh, log in with it, and uh, there you go. You are authenticated without a password. So that's 
how these plugins work. The server needs to know to call them, and when it does call them, they produce the result they are expected to produce. So, not, not very complex, I hope. And there's various kinds of plugins, too. I mean, various plugin types. There's the authentication plugin, there's all of these guys, like six or seven. Okay, so this one is our new take on the plugin system architecture. We thought it would be easier if we uh, start uh, from scratch, because there are certain architectural limitations with plugins that will not be easy to overcome as a kind of continuous development. So we decided to make a completely new interface uh, based on the idea of uh, components and the kind of micro services that you expose and use. This is new in 8.0, so if you want to play with that, you need MySQL 8.0. But, uh, well, since it is new functionality, that's natural, I guess. As you can see, the architecture here is quite different. There's no server as a central focal point anymore. Uh, there's just a bunch of components talking to each and every other component through services. That's the premise. I want to make a reference to the Windows COM architecture. Uh, I know it's not very popular in your circles, but uh, it does have some, some good ideas there. And namely, the good ideas is that uh, the interfaces are an abstract thing that may have one or many implementations. That's the basic good idea that I like in COM and I try to implement here as well. Right. So... Pros and cons of components, obviously. Uh, each component can only uh, consume services, so you get as a benefit uh, an explicit list of dependencies. Basically, you know what you need. But ju just based on the services that this component is asking for. Uh, then all components are EQ and there's no central command, so to say. Uh, every, um, every component can talk on an EQ footing with every other component or implement or consume the services available. So there's no special place for the server anymore. Uh, it can also overwrite existing implementations. As I said, uh, a service is an abstract entity. So you can have uh, many implementations of that, of that service, but uh, only one is considered the uh, quote-unquote default implementations. And if your code is asking for the default implementation and not for any specific implementation, then if you switch the default implementation, you can basically overwrite functionality that may be in another component through your own, uh, through your own uh, implementation of that service. So it's obviously very different. It requires a central registry of all the interfaces, and we have that. So every component, when it is initialized, it gets a interface pointer to the registry. So you can search for components and for services and implementations there, and then components register their implement the implementations of their services into the registry as well. Right. Uh, so some cons. Uh, we have a bridge between plugins and components. So we have a plugin service that allows you to get to the registry. So if you have a plugin or you are uh, you want to modify one, you can start with that and then access the registry to that bridge and then talk components. Uh, but well, not all plugin APIs are yet converted into component APIs. We plan to do that, but it does take time. And some APIs, some plugin APIs, have like 300 methods. That's just not reasonable. Uh, so that will take some work, but we are doing that evolutionally. Uh, we took one 
plugin type, the password verification, and we converted it into a component. So you can see how this is done, comparing the 5.7 plugin implementation towards the 8.0's uh, component implementation. So there are examples already, but it's work in progress in a way. Uh, right. So that's where we are at right now. Uh, I have some samples for you. I'll be quick to leave some time for questions. This is how uh, declaring uh, a service looks like. So you define your service by name. You define two methods for it, uh, validate and get strength. And then uh, you implement the methods. So this is the bottom part is how implementing one method looks like. Basically, uh, it takes arguments and then does something and returns uh, whatever the, the definition of the method is uh, right here. So not very different from plugins is what I'm trying to, to show you. We have helper macros to kind of hide some of the complexities. Uh, and it uh, it looks similar to plugins. So if you are kind of comfortable doing plugins, you should also be comfortable doing components, I would guess. Okay, so that thing before that was a service, and this is how the description of one component look, looks like. So you start by uh, defining the component and what services does it provide. So there goes your dependency tracking. And then uh, you have a bunch of uh, requirements. Basically, it does need some services. So it explicitly states what it needs. And that's really great when you want to load multiple components. You know which one you need to load and is it possible to load that particular component. And of course, there is the standard metadata type of thing, similar to plugins. So nothing scary there, really. OK, so um, yeah. Uh, I have an example here on uh, how to implement uh, this uh, service, really. No, so, sorry, how to use it. So this is how you uh, basically access the registry. Uh, we have the registry pointer, and then we call acquire with the name of the service over here. And we get an interface pointer, which we basically uh, typecast to the, to the right type, service type of validate password, and then we j can just call that, basically. So that's the, the hard way. Uh, and there is a bit of a better way. We have a helper class for you, which is called my service. Uh, it does take all of these parameters and does the proper typecasting, so you can just, well, then call the thing. And it also does acquire and release for you when it goes out of scope. So kind of a convenience thing. Okay. So a few words on the pull requests. I won't go into details here because I'm sure you you have encountered this site on the left, right? That's GitHub. Uh, so basically, what I want to show you here is that whenever you do that, basically file a pull request in GitHub, you automatically, uh, we have some automation here, you automatically end up with that. So we get a proper notification directly from GitHub with all the necessary information there, with a link to the GitHub uh, repository. So we fully integrated um, pull requests uh, into, into our uh, own internal processes. So that should be kind of easy for you. You just do your pull request, and then you communicate either via the GitHub or via the back API. Up to you, really. And last but not least, I am really proud because I spent a lot of effort on it to show you the MySQL Doxygen documentation. 
So starting with 8.0, uh, we are putting significant effort into documenting the code in the proper way. And uh, I have most of the protocol documentation converted and updated to the latest details of the protocol into Doxygen. And there's also a ton of function and API documentation that will help you reading the code. Also, also some nice uh, diagrams, as you can see here, explaining the workflows. So yes, uh, that's your new place to basically start reading the MySQL code. Uh, we are, we tend, intend to put a lot of effort into that and on a continuous basis. That's our prime documentation source nowadays. Even for internal, internally ramping up new developers and stuff like that. So you get basically the royal treatment <laughs> if you read that. Okay, so what you should, uh, this, there was a lot of technical stuff here and a lot of source code, but these are the important par parts. You should always consider, at least when working with eight, uh, trying to consider a component if you want to add something. That's the most basic and most robust way that you can uh, that you can use and you need to go to the plugin if you need an existing API or you need to call into something that's not yet a component service so that's when you go to plugins and finally if you just need an SQL function then you do then you do your DFs and if nothing else works there's always the pull request. So that's my talk in a nutshell. That's how you select. Okay, with that, I have four minutes for questions. Anybody? Anything. It does not have to be plugin related. It, any MySQL questions? It's okay. One thing I forgot to mention. MySQL has a brand new GA release called MySQL 8. Uh, it has a lot of functionality, as you noticed, uh, not only on the, under the hood, but also user-facing. Uh, so please go and try it out. Uh, it has a lot to offer. Yes? Right. Okay. So uh, basically, we will uh, we will update the documentation uh, with the uh, with the description of the services. See, we are in the process of doing that. So yes, it's going to be properly documented in Doxygen all these methods and services. Yeah. It's, it, it does go deep, yes. We plan to use it for our own internal purposes as well. Okay, great. Uh, any more questions? Anybody? No? Then I thank you for your time, and uh, I hope you have good time using or, well, learning about MySQL. Thank you.